and welcome back everyone to Ethnic Politics. I promise this week is only one lecture, um, but it's a good one. This week we are looking at the relationship between language and symbols among the dominant and subordinate classes. Now I was really looking forward to this week for a couple of reasons. First is we get to look at how group identity changes vis-a-vis -vis their interaction between in-group and out-group members. And more specifically, when I'm talking about out-group, I'm talking about interacting with people that are perceived to be um, either above their socioeconomic station, so there needs to be some kind of performative gesture of deference and respect, or if we're even talking about upper classes, how do they relate to people on a lower socioeconomic or sociopolitical plane? Um, and it's not as straightforward, right, as one might think. Um, the chief reading for this week is a book that I uh, was originally introduced to when I was in grad school many, many years ago, and uh, I'm really happy to be offering it uh, again, actually for the first time in really any class, um, James Scott's Domination and the Arts of Resistance. And that is really going to be our primary read for the week, um, accentuated by a couple of case studies, uh, one of which um, is represented here in this picture, uh, the phenomenon of the casita, uh, the casitas of the South Bronx, which kind of dotted uh, this sort of blighted urban landscape throughout the uh, 70s, 80s, and even into uh, the early 90s. So there's a lot of neat stuff for us to talk about. There's a lot of stuff for us to um, unpack and dissect, especially from uh, Scott's writings. So let's jump right in. And we are really um, continuing our discussions from last week and the week before um, over three major themes. Uh, the first is our continuing discussion of the role of narrative as a component of group identity. So the previous two weeks um, saw us looking at the importance of narrative and symbol. So I'm hoping that by now uh, you understand what a narrative is and how it frames and shapes the perceptions of in-group versus out-group members. Um, what we will be looking at in this week is how these narratives change across and between classes. This is um, really what Scott's work, Domination of the Arts of Resistance, uh, is all about. Uh, to that, we will continue to examine the close relationship between culture and ethnic identity, and this is something that we have been talking about uh, effectively since week one. We will be continuing our look at how culture's relationship with other groups shapes and directs ethnic identity. So um, one's perception of the self, one's perception of being part of a larger group, uh, defined by, among other things, um, linguistic, ethnic, religious, idiosyncratic characteristics are oftentimes shaped by our relationship with non-group members. So this goes back to the sort of the us-them dichotomy, right? And there really is no us if there isn't a them, right? If there's nothing for us to kind of bounce our identities off of, um, we don't really see them as identities. We don't see them as distinctive group markers. And these things work both within the formal and informal settings, especially among um, you know, what I will just call, uh, call subordinate classes. Oftentimes, culture and ethnic identity takes further shape within the informal, right? Especially because these groups do not have access to privilege power and authority, but they map out their identity and they make do with what they have um, through informal social networks and informal elements of group cohesion and cooperation. The casitas is certainly one of those uh, neat, neat phenomenon. And finally, we are continuing our examination of the use of language as an element of deference and defiance. So, you know, once again, as part of this certificate in international relations, languages, and diplomacy, um, we will be looking at how public and hidden transcripts are shaped around word choice, the use of slang and colloquial, and more to the point, what I have noted for really a long time is the linguistic advantage of the subordinate as a form of resistance. So what do I mean here? I mean that more often than not, subordinate groups 
tend to be more multilingual than dominant. Right? The subordinate group speaks their own language, but they have to learn the language of the prevailing culture, of the prevailing political group. The ones on top are kind of privileged and at the same time cursed with being part of this group, and as such, they don't need to learn a language that is inherent to them, but at the same time, they feel that they don't need to learn the language of a lower group of people. So this is one of the reasons why, I think, subordinate groups in places like the United States, for instance, um, keep their language. You know, people always wonder, you know, why don't people speak English more and more? I mean, they do when they have to speak with people at a higher plane and when they are engaging in public transcripts. But when they are speaking amongst themselves, and this isn't anything sinister or diabolical or anything else like that, right? But people will default into... Um, their more native, more immigrant ethnic languages, um, you know, due first in no small measure to just the large numbers, but secondly because there is a way in which people identify solidarity with one another by speaking that same language, whether it's Spanish to Spanish, Chinese to Chinese, um, you know, you name it. So language is also very much a part of this, you know, dual track set of transcripts, both public as well as hidden. And so that kind of leads us to just, you know, identify what we're going to be looking at this week. And as I've already mentioned, James Scott's Domination in the Arts of Resistance is the primary read. And I had you um, read the first two chapters, first the introduction, and secondly, uh, I guess what's really the main theoretical chapter on domination, acting, and fantasy. But it's, it, and while Scott does provide a number of examples within his work, right, specifically within you know, literature and, you know, certain, um, you know, anthology collected writings and, and, and memoirs of, you know, former slaves. Um, it's worth putting this into something more contemporary for all of you. So we're also going to be looking um, at Cornell West's essay on Malcolm X and Black Rage and how Black Rage differentiated from the more nonviolent resistance of Martin Luther King and whether Malcolm X knew the consequences of effectively acting, quote unquote, out of character and rejecting the narratives of the dominant class in favor of a more parallel um, set of meta narratives for black Americans. And then we're going to be looking at a very short, uh, but I think very poignant article. Um, I feel like I'm in my country, Puerto Rican casitas in New York City, which um, interestingly enough, is something that most people today don't really know about. I mean, we are really talking about something, you know, 35, 40, 45 somewhat years ago. And, you know, while some people might remember or their parents might remember that New York was not as, uh, let's say, gentrified as it is today, um, people did live here and people did make use of the world around them or lack thereof. So I think that the Casitas is a really good case of hidden transcripts um, forming a sense of um, group community in making the best out of a rather difficult um, situation of urban blight. Okay? So with all of that said, let's, let's jump right into uh, some of the main points here and let me you know, help flesh out um, some of the uh, arguments and points that Scott raises. Um, you know, his, his writing might be um, a little bit more, you know, I don't know, scholarly jargonistic in some cases. So for an undergraduate class, let me, you know, help you out here. Um, Scott's work studies how interactions between dominant and subordinate classes are shaped and carried out, right? So th this is something that I'm sure that all of you have, you know, experienced at some point, right? How to talk professionally to someone with a higher station, right? Your boss, your teachers, your college instructors. Um, and do you talk and interact the same way as you do with your peers, right? Your own, let's say, group of friends, people that you, f that you feel are more on an equal plane with you. So what Scott notices is that beyond just simply the art of diplomatic email writing, right? There is a noted language and ritual Right, in which the weaker project respect and deference while the strong assert authority and leadership. Right? So there's kind of these unspoken um, roles 
that both sides play, right? Within this um, either or um, black, white, yin, yang scenario here, right? One takes the more subordinate role and the other one has the more dominant. Um, but the question here is, is deference genuine or is it feigned? And at the same time, is authority accepted or is it just simply tolerated, right? So what Scott is effectively asking here is when subordinate groups kind of, you know, give that, um, you know, element of respect and um, deference to someone higher above them, um, you know, a landlord, um, a teacher, a boss, um, the cop who pulls you over, um, is this um, deference and this respect genuine? Or does the subordinate feel that they are being aggrieved, harassed, um, inconvenienced, annoyed, right? Um, how many times have you, um, you know, sat in a classroom and you kind of realized that the instructor really didn't know what he or she was doing or, more to, to the point, didn't care about whether you understood him or her or not? Um, and rather than you sort of showing your frustration that, you know, your tuition money is being wasted, you just kind of sit there and you do what needs to be, you know, you, what, what, what needs to be done. And you just kind of go through the motions and hopefully, you know, you get the A. Um, and at the same time, right, as people at the top, do they give this um, aura of authority um, but believe that they carry this authority or do they feel that they have to do this? Uh, in order to create professional boundary lines and show that they are in charge. So how do, you know, groups communicate with each other across these boundaries? And more to the point, we would find out to answer both of these questions, how do in-group members communicate differently, right? So, you know, can we understand deference to be rhetorical if subordinate groups speak more openly and defiantly among one another. So for instance, right, you know, everybody is quiet in a class, the instructor is, you know, giving a lecture, not the most engaging, but everybody's quiet, everybody's taking notes, you know, the instructor every so often is like, you know, stop talking or don't do this, don't do that, right? And as soon as class is done, um, does everybody just kind of get up and leave and continue to be quiet? Or do you speak amongst yourselves about how, um, you know, problematic the instructor is, you know? When do you talk about authority behind its back? If you do, right, that is the more hidden transcript that people speak to one another in safety and security, okay? And it's more than just simply talking bad about someone or something out of earshot from them. How do subordinate groups um, perform everyday acts of resistance? Right? Not open rebellion, but just, you know, how do they, um, you know, what actions and forms of subtle resistance can we find uh, among these subordinate classes? Um, you know, again, just to keep in, t in the mindset of, let's say, the, um, the, the college student, college instructor. Do you deliberately show up late? Um, do you, um, you know, not like 10 minutes late, but maybe like, you know, one or two minutes after class begins? Uh, do you decide to whip out your phone and, you know, uh, flip through Facebook? Um, do you, um, you know, not answer um, questions uh, necessarily? Or better yet, do you kind of show indifference uh, when you're in class? You're not openly rebelling. You're not challenging anybody's authority. But you're making it kind of known, right, that you're not going to just take this on the cheek. Um, what other forms of resistance do we have in everyday life where we somehow try to um, not overthrow authority, but make it known that authority is at best you know, barely tolerated, right? And authority's respect needs to be earned. It's not just simply taken, right? So these are a few questions to think about, right, before we get started, right? And, and, and think about things in your everyday life here. You want to talk about if, if you identify as a subordinate group, and look, we all do in this case, right? None of us are the 1%. We're not the bankers. We're not the financiers. We, we don't run the world here. Um, what do we do as everyday forms of resistance? Um, <clears throat> do you go through the emergency exit to bypass the MetroCard turnstile if an opportunity arises? 
right? Do you feel, no, 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 my Metro card, I swipe, I'm a good citizen. How many times have you been there and someone is walking out of the emergency exit and the door is right there? Now you look around and you're like, there's no, you know, Metro police, there's no NYPD, there's no, you know, it's just like, hey, you know, I don't know, what is it, 275 this time? Or is, I think they even upped it to three now. It's like, it's expensive. So do you just, you know, hey, opportunity, you know, knocks, I'm going to go and take it. Um, or how about this one? How many of you have felt that rather than going through the emergency exit door that's open, you decide that you're going to help out your fellow citizen by instead of leaving the subway through the turnstile, you decide to open the emergency exit anyway, saying, hey, guys, I'm, you know, I'm paying it back, right? There's this sense of commuter solidarity, um, which may work a little bit more in sub subway stations uh, as opposed to others. Um, how likely are you to play with your phone during class, right? Does it depend on the instructor? Um, do you even feel that this is a form of resistance? Do you feel that, um, no, I'm going to go, you know, uh, search Facebook or go through Instagram while the professor is talking because, you know, screw him and his authority? Or do you feel that, um, you know, there is, you know, like, what do you do? What conditions are necessary for you to pay full attention? And when do you start just kind of, you know, disengaging every so often? Um, how about this one? If there weren't penalties for speaking your mind, if there weren't repercussions for saying what you really want to say, would you be more honest with your boss, with your superiors? Would you be more honest with people in power that make your life unnecessarily more difficult, right? And this is one of the things about hidden transcripts is that we will engage in forms of passive resistance because we know that we cannot openly challenge authority, at least not every day, you know, or unless we know for a fact that we have, a, you know, the entire group behind us and, you know, this is really the last straw. But on, on more than enough occasions where it's just everyday expected BS, if you knew that you could get away with saying what you wanted to say, would you do it, right? And the reason why you don't is because of penalties. And that is one of the things that the, that the subordinate classes have to realize more than the dominant. And this kind of, you know, fits into the last question. Are you polite to the police officer who pulled you over because you hope he or she will let you off if you show good behavior? You know, like how many times have you been pulled over by the cops and the first thing in your mind, you see the lights behind you and you're just sort of like, you know, son of a bitch, like really me of all things. And you're angry, right? You don't feel guilty. You don't feel sorry. You feel angry that you got pulled over, but you compose yourself. Cop comes over, right? And what's the first thing that you do? You try to be polite. You know, hello, officer. How are you today? You know, in and in, you know, most situations, you would look at them and just be like, seriously, like, don't you have anything better to do? You know, and they, you know, unless you're like going 120 in a 55. OK, I could see that, you know, <laughs> but in many situations, you'd be not, you, you know, you're nice to the cop. And if you go to traffic court, you're nice to the prosecutor because you want to show that you're somehow cooperative. You're a team player. You're respectful. And maybe that might get them to um Reduce the penalty. Maybe that might get them to let you off with a warning. And here's the thing. They might even know that. They might even go up to them, go up to your car thinking, all right, if this person is polite and cooperative, you know, I might give them a break. If the person is belligerent and all, you know, indignant that, uh, you know, I had the audacity to pull them over, well then, hey, you know, guess what? I'm going to write you a ticket. And I might even write you a ticket for something that I wouldn't have even written you up for. Normally, it's like, okay, you're speeding, all right, that's a point thing. Maybe I'll write you a ticket for, um, uh, I don't know, busted taillight or um, vanity plate cover is covering your license plate, which is one of those things that the cops will tell you. It's like, all right, I'm going to write you up for a vanity plate that's covering up the license plate, even though that's not a problem at all. The cop kind of looks at you and says, take it. It's a lesser fine. There's no points. I got to write you up. But, you know, you don't have to go to traffic court. It's a $50 fine as opposed to at least 80 to 100 bucks plus traffic court. So there's a language that's even being given from the police officer as well. There's a language not just of spoken words, but of mannerisms, of vibes, and of protocol. 
So these are all of the things, right, that I'm sure that you've known about, but we haven't really put into any definitional form in the, you know, in the, in the sense of transcripts, public and hidden. So public transcripts, right, and these are the, you know, the open interactions, the open forms of communication between subordinates and those who dominate, right? It's the official, the formal, and professional forms of communication. It is the ways in which we um, ultimately end up speaking to the cops, speaking to our bosses. It's the, it's the way in which we will compose an email that is professional, respectful, and deferential, even though the email is, it could be very simple. Hey, could you write me a letter of recommendation? Um, hey, I don't know why you gave me the grade that I got. Um, but that is, th those two ways of doing it would be someone that you would see as your peer, right? You're not going to send your professor, hey, could you write me a letter of recommendation? And that's it, right? The response is going to be no. And there's this long-winded paragraph that comes in saying, you know, oh, I really enjoyed your class last semester. I learned a lot, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, I know you want to write me a letter of recommendation. Okay, fine, cool, right? But it's this understanding that the dominant has power in this interaction, Right? The dominant wields power, leverage, and authority over the subordinate. The student is asking for a letter of recommendation. They need one, but they're still requesting it. And it's my decision to either go yay or nay. The student is asking for clarification on why he or she got a bad grade. Um, they're not demanding a grade change, at least not yet but they're angry, they're upset, and they would want to know more. So they're going to go to the instructor who they might actually feel unjustifiably gave them a bad grade or is out of you know, his or her authority to give a bad grade, but they're still going to be deferential and respectful. So the public transcript is, you know, in what Scott says, kind of this performance that we do, you know, the subordinates give deference to the stronger, and the stronger expect this and also feel like they need to act within character as well. Now, this is different from what Scott calls the hidden transcripts. Right? The hidden transcripts, the discourse that takes place off stage beyond direct observation of power holders. So this is the stuff that's you know mentioned within group members outside of earshot of out group. Hidden transcripts are the language and narratives in group members speak to one another, and this is the best part within safety and security. So when you know that someone that you're speaking to has got your back, is in the same boat as you, or does not have the ability to use these words against you, or you feel that you can trust them to keep a secret, well then you're going to say what's really on your mind. Then you're going to say what you truly feel about something, about someone, about whatever it is that aggrieves you, but you're going to hold your tongue, swallow your pride, deal with it at the professional and official level. Hidden transcripts may even be the speeches, the arguments, and the comebacks that we rehearse in our heads on a daily basis. right? And I'm sure that you've all have done this, right? You have all have finally have come up with the greatest comeback, the greatest argument that in your mind you are fantasizing telling this one person or these groups of people. And in your mind, you have dumbfounded them. You know, their jaws have dropped. You, you, you know, their jaws drop and your mic drops and you walk out. You feel all vindicted, right? You have scored a point for the little man. Right? You have told the judge, you've told the cop, you've told the instructor, you've told your boss, you've told your superior, you've told your landlord where they can stick it, and you feel good about it, and you just kind of walk down the street and strut. We rehearse these in our heads, but we rarely will speak them to the person that we want. And sometimes, sometimes, we are in a position where we can say that to them, but we will pull our punches because we still feel that we don't want to be as risky and confrontational as possible. Because we know 
that there could be repercussions. So what we ultimately end up doing is instead of speaking our minds, right, hidden transcripts are visible through various acts of passive defiance and resistance against authority, right? Um, again, not open rebellion, but think like um, herd mentality going through the emergency exit of the subway. One person goes through, two or three more are going to go through, right? I mean, that's just, you know, how it, you know, how it is. Um, so it's either resistance against authority or once authority is within their own group, right? The students are dismissed, the tenants are, you know, the rent is paid, whatever it happens to be, authority can admit frustration, impatience, or even guilt among one another, right? So, you know, students could oftentimes talk to one another about how the faculty are just unfair to them. This class is just way too hard. Um, you know, there's so many other things that are going on in their lives. Why are they being, um, you know, constantly harassed and um, annoyed? At the same time, when, and you know, when students are out of earshot, faculty may talk to one another and say, you know, I really just don't understand why students today seem so angry and defiant, why they seem so disrespectful. I really want them to learn. They just don't seem into it. I wish that I could do something about it. I wish that we didn't have to give this stupid exam. I wish that we didn't have to grade the way that we do. Um, you know, in many cases, I wish that we didn't have the pedagogy, the curriculum that we're told to do. And this is not even so much college. This is grade school, right? where we have to, as instructors, give certain mandated exams and lesson plans that we know don't work and we know frustrate the students, but are instructors going to tell their students that all of this is bullshit, right? I mean, that is really kind of breaking protocol by admitting, um, oftentimes, the faults and weaknesses of authority. It's not like it doesn't happen. It's not like it doesn't happen. When it does happen, now all of a sudden there's a greater sense of familiarity, but it really comes, you know, during rare events and occasions. But so, you know, in order to understand all of this, right, public transcripts, hidden transcripts, different meanings, different narratives, different forms of communication. Hence, the public transcript is rarely, if ever, the whole story. Right? This is what Scott is also very clear on saying, is that the formal etiquette and protocol and interaction that we have um, rarely gives you the full picture, right? especially, especially if there is a noted discrepancy between the public and hidden transcripts. So in other words, what Scott is saying is, how do we know if deference to authority is genuine? One way of knowing is once the subordinate group kind of does their little, you know, ritualistic genuflections towards authority, right? Um, metaphorically, follow them home. You know, follow them home, follow them home back to their own little neighborhoods, their own little, you know, working class bars, their own little communities, and eavesdrop on them. And if all they do is talk smack about authority, then you know that that deference is feigned you know that it is there simply as a coping and survival mechanism. So public transcript is not the whole story. Um, also, to a degree that the dominant suspect that the public transcript from subordinates is performative, mistrust exists. In other words, if the dominant group kind of knows that the lower groups are just kind of doing this just for the sake of not being punished, right? if there already is tension between dominant and subordinate. If there already is this idea that I have cracked the whip enough to get them to be obedient, I know for a fact that I haven't broken them. They just realize they cannot act out. But that does not mean that they like me. That does not mean that they even respect me. It just simply is they don't have any other recourse. So mistrust might actually increase, especially if authority is imposed and enforced. So the more that you try to be the strict enforcer at the top for order, discipline, everything else like that, right? 
yes, you may get visual compliance, but there's going to be a lot of grumbling. And at the slightest opportunity, right, the subordinate group will act out if necessary. And this is really the case when hidden transcripts become public. Um, it doesn't happen often, but it usually happens when the subordinate, you know, in so many words, can't take it anymore or realizes, you know what, I have nothing left to lose. I'll take the repercussions. I honestly don't care anymore, right? I would rather speak my mind than be an ass kisser. Once that happens, the etiquette of power relations is breached. Now, it could be just one person that finally says, you know, I'm not going to take this stuff anymore. Um, and they'll suffer the consequences. They might be ostracized. They might be removed from their position. Uh, they might be reprimanded. If it's known that one person has decided, you know what, I'm taking it for the team. And even though they might not have um, known that I was going to finally speak my mind today, uh, trust me, um, I speak on behalf of the entire group. Right? I speak on behalf of the entire parish. If you remember that um, one excerpt from the introduction of Scott's work um, from Adam Bede when Mrs. Poisoner right, finally decides to speak her mind to the landlord. And she says, you know, look, you can run off and you can find ways of retaliation, but please understand that it's not just going to be against me. But I speak on behalf of the entire community here. Right? And the only reason why they're quiet is because they've been afraid to speak their mind. Me, I don't care anymore. I've said it. I've had it out. And trust me, I speak on behalf of all of them. So you might be angry at me, but you got a whole group of people that think that you're a jackass. And then afterwards, when, he, when the landlord runs off and leaves, right, her husband turns to her and says, well, that's it. The cat's out of the bag. You know, it's no going back. And she responds to him and says, you know what? I feel better about it. I said what I needed to say. I got it out of my system. I'll take the repercussions. But I would rather sleep well knowing that I said what I said on my feet, you know, and keeping my own dignity than feigning deference and being an ass kisser. So in many cases, when the hidden becomes public, it's because it's, it's been a long time coming, right? Just anger and resentment has been brewing and simmering. And trust me, those are those times where those comebacks and those speeches and those acts of defiance that you've rehearsed in front of the mirror to yourself, that's when it finally says, I can't, it, it can't be held in any longer. And, you know, if we were to put this to um, contemporary studies, right, this can result, right, in a full-scale power struggle, especially if the hidden transcript speaks on behalf of an entire race, class, or social strata. Hence the 1992 Los Angeles riots, hence the whole Black Lives Matter movement, among other examples. These are just two that I'm giving. But, you know, as we spoke about beforehand, right, the, the 92 L.A. riots were just not some spontaneous act of vandalism and savagery, but it was pent-up anger, rage, frustration that had been going on and simmering through the African-American uh, community for years. And it's not just some um, open-ended general feeling of injustice, but it is a specific feeling of being targeted harassed and um, discriminated against by the Los Angeles Police Department. So when it is known that it is an institution from above that is actively targeting a socio-economic and socio-political group below, we know that the discrimination, the racism, the inequalities are systemic. So it's not just one person punking someone else, but it's a collective feeling that Rodney King was all of us at some point. And the fact that the cops who beat him got off were found not guilty, that creates the rage. And in a, in a way, this is connected to the Black Lives Matter movement uh, more than you know 25 years later with the understanding of the same thing, right? There is systematic discrimination by not just one police force, but across the country against blacks. Whites get preferential treatment. Blacks are seen as guilty until proven innocent. And this is when the hidden transcript that had been simmering for years kind of explodes 
into um, this movement that says black lives do matter. That is a hidden transcript. That is a hidden transcript that has now been turned public. Okay? So, you know, note, you know, note the importance of transcript, language, and diplomacy. All right, let's just kind of take a little step back for a moment here and put this within the larger context of this thematic study that this class is associated with. Hidden transcripts, especially if they are associated with a particular ethnic group, might make use of disguise, deception, and indirection while maintaining an outward impression of cooperation and obedience in power relations. Okay? This is known as the politics of disguise and anonymity. And one of the things that helps understand anonymity is the idea that the dominant class doesn't really know much about the day-to-day -day workings, mannerisms, forms of communication, and rituals of communication between these members. They might see the group as docile. They might see them as hardworking. They might see them as obedient and willing to, you know, undertake a number of tasks that might violate safety procedures, that might, you know, come with salaries paid under the table that are below market value. And they think, well, they'll do it. I certainly won't, but they will. That belies the understanding that the hidden transcripts among these groups are, yeah, we're taking a number of high-risk jobs that pay very little. But we're the ones that actually know how to do things, you know? We're the ones that know, we're the ones that do all of the manual labor. And, you know, there is this, I, I think there was this, um, this movie or this, um, uh, this essay, I, I forget what exactly it was, um, but it kind of envisioned a day in which all the Mexicans of, I think, either California or Texas or just the, you know, the American Southwest decided to just collectively, as a group, stop working. Like, just, just kind of take the day off and just not go to work, not do anything. Um, and the understanding was the American economy would suffer a tremendous blow, right? Food would not be prepared or, you know, grown or harvested. Um, roads would not be repaired. Um, you know, sewers would not be unclogged. Walls would not be painted. Roofs would not be replaced. Um, you know, all of the um, work that we just assume happens around the scenes here, right, relies on subordinate classes to do that stuff, right? And within that group, right, they might be doing it every single day. They're talking to one another in Spanish. And, you know, for the most part, white Americans don't speak Spanish. Or they speak a very textbook version of Spanish, which the Hispanics, the Latinos, they know about. So in a way, all you have to do is just speak Spanish to one another. You don't know what they're saying. You could smile and laugh, and they could be talking about how much of an asshole this one person is, but they're feigning happiness, right? Now, I'm not saying that this is the case. Don't feel like I'm, you know, don't all of a sudden think, oh my God, you know, they're, they're here to take over, whatever it is, right? But what I'm trying to, you know, mention here is that as long as the dominant groups really give no attention or, 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 or sensitivities to the lower classes, lower classes are effectively allowed to go through their hidden transcripts, sometimes in even broad daylight. This is what Scott knows as infrapolitics. The infrapolitics of subordinate groups will place activities and decisions within a structure created and demarcated by the dominant classes. So rather than engaging in actual open rebellion, right, Subordinate classes realize that they are limited in what they can do. But still, even there, right, they can show certain acts of defiance, non-compliance, or at the absolute least, just pointing out the utter ridiculousness of the current system. So, you know, in so many words, infrapolitics of subordinate groups is we act against the system within the system, Right? So, so as to not be punished by the system. Um, and there's a lot of wiggle room, there's a lot of versatility that can take place uh, within these subordinate groups um, as long as they are not openly you know, breaking the law. Um, and it might not even be a way of trying to diminish the power 
of the dominant group as it is just to simply show solidarity, um, group identity, and comradeship, um, not only within group members, but with other group members that are perceived to be at the same socioeconomic level, right? So it's that type of class-based solidarity, class-based cooperation. Um, you know, take a look even more um, specifically at language in the way in which um, it is spoken and written, right? We've already talked about the language of formal emails and letters, which oftentimes involves a lot of, you know, rhetorical, gratuitous uh, writings here or there. You know, I mean, trust me, there have been plenty of times in my, in my day where I have written an email to somebody above my station, and that usually involves like two paragraphs, and one of them is deferential and respectful and tries to give all the information. Not, you know, I don't want to make it look like I don't know what I'm talking about. And, you know, two, three days later, the email finally comes back with like a one sentence thing. No, dear Mike, no, respectfully yours. It's just sort of like, sure, go ahead. Um, I guess I can do that. Stop by my office tomorrow. No punctuation, <laughs> no period. It's almost as if like they had texted it out. But guess what? They're higher up than me. So they can kind of get away with that. Could I do that to them? Absolutely not, right? Absolutely not. Could I do that to my students? You know, some of them will write me a three, four paragraph email effectively asking me to write them a letter of recommendation for law school. It's a yes, no, can you or can't you? Um, and unless, unless the student has had me for like four or five classes and a level of mutual respect has been established where they could just walk up to me and say, yo, Rossi, I need a letter for a uh, uh, grad school. Can you write me one? And I'd be like, absolutely, of course. I'd be insulted if you didn't ask me one, right? But if it's someone that's only had me for like one or two classes um, and I know them, but they still want to, you know, but it's still sort of more of a formal um, separation, sure, they are going to, you know, dear Dr. Rossi, I hope this email finds you well. Like, I should write back at one point saying, no, the email did not find me well. It found me actually in a state of misery, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> I am humbly asking if you could blah, 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 write me a letter of recommendation. I took you in this class and that class. Um, you were a great instructor. I learned a lot. I feel that, you know, and it's just this long-winded thing which justifies them asking me the letter. And I could simply say yes or no. Now, there are times, more often than not, I'll say yes, sure. There are a number of times where I've actually have said no, not because I didn't want to, but because I didn't know the student well enough. They may have been one of 85 in a class. They did their work, but I could go through the roster and say, okay, the student did their work and got, you know, a high B plus. But I would effectively be writing a narrative um, alongside numerical transcripts. Now, I could just simply write back and say, you know, no, I don't know you enough. But in a form of authority, I will write back respectfully to the student explaining in detail why I can't write them a letter of recommendation for that very same reason. I don't know you enough to evaluate your skills, your qualifications that I know you have for grad school. I don't know if they have them or not, but I'm trying to be deferential and I'm trying to be polite. And I will say, I hope that you have other instructors that you have asked who could write more openly about your abilities. I want you to get into grad school, and as such, I feel that my letter would not be as powerful as someone else's. So I am in a position of authority giving some kind of professionalism back, right? That's the public transcript. The public transcript in this case is, I wish you the best in grad school, law school, wherever. I, am, I apologize for not being able to have enough information to validate your skills. And I want the selection committee to really look at you and evaluate you. And I feel that my letter would be weak. Now, that's the public transcript. The private transcript could very well be where I will talk to a peer of mine and say, you know, if someone emails me asking me for a letter of recommendation, and the first thing in the email is, I don't know if you remember me, comma, then chances are I'm not going to, and you shouldn't ask me for a letter. Now, am I going to say that in the email? Of course not. But that's the private transcript that I may, I'm not saying that I do, but we may say to our peers. And the student 
getting the rejection from me or someone else back, right? They might write back and say, thank you for being honest. I truly appreciate that. Um, you know, have a good day. And under their breath, they could be like, well, fuck him, right? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know, okay? But note the vocabulary that goes into these requests. Note also, and this is something outside of English. We don't have this in English, but we have this in a lot of other languages, the notion of formal and informal speaking, right? And if you can speak Spanish or German or French or serbo Croatian or Greek or anything else like that, right? You know, right, that there is two versions of the second person. There is the formal as well as the informal, right? And so if you're speaking to somebody who is just simply older than you, you're going to use the formal, right? Instead of como estas, you know, como esta usted, right? And this is the one thing I remember when I was taking Spanish in school, right? Usted as opposed to estas, right? Um, in Serbo-Croatian, instead of the T, you use the V, right? For more formal. You will say the inf you'll speak informal to your parents because it's family, but you will never use the informal to a friend's parent, right? That's just expected unless, unless they tell you, you can speak to me in the informal, right? So I got relatives in Austria, you know, saw them, you know, a number of years ago, and I was speaking German to them, but in the formal, and they looked at me like, ah, oh, no, 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 come on, you, you, you don't need to say, you know, see, you can say do. I'm like, okay, cool, you know, that's, that's it. But only after they give you that permission, you're not going to just automatically assume that you're going to speak in the informal. That's considered a breach of protocol, okay? Which on the opposite end of that spectrum, we find that, um, especially within communist and socialist circles, you know, even today, um, there is this barrier breaking and, you know, for, you know, contemporary purposes, a gender neutral uh, use of addressing someone as just simply comrade. There is no public or private. It is now all blended. It doesn't matter your station. You just refer to one another as comrade, right? Comrade this, comrade that. Um, and the best part about it is, is that, at least in Russian, uh, the word for comrade, tovarish, is neutral. So there's no feminine or masculine association. It's just tovarish, tovarish, right? Um, again, this type of diplomacy incorpor is far more inclusive, right? The use of formal language denotes this exclusivity, but also the importance of formality, right? So the understanding here is depending on who you, whom you're speaking with, right? Will you be speaking more professional or will you default to more informal language, right? Informal language. Let me just go back to the classroom setting because this is something that I know quite well. On the, you know, the first part of the semester, you know, you want to be as professional as possible. You know? If you're an instructor on the first day and you just show up talking to students as if they were, you know, any old people and every other word that came out of your mouth was a curse or a slang or this or that, you know, you might get one or two students that are like, oh, this is going to be a cool professor. But everyone else is going to say, I'm very uncomfortable in this class, right? Because that formality is being broken. So you remain professional. You choose your words the right way. Is, you know, even when you are in a position of authority, you can't just simply say whatever is on your mind. You need to project authority, but you also need to ensure, right, that those that are receiving your authority appreciate it, right? You also need to know that they will somehow respect you and vice versa, right? Students need to understand also that there is a role to play. Now, if it's later on in the semester or you are teaching a class where students that you've had three, four, five times already show up. You know, I've had one or two in my day where, you know, it's an upper level senior class and I've had these students since the since their freshman year and I walk in, I just kind of look around and I'm like, all right, you all know who I am. I know who you are. You know what the rules are. Let's go. And they're like rocking, you know. Okay, then there is there there is no public or hidden it's all blended because we're all in that, we're, we, we, we are talking hidden transcripts. This is now in group members. So it is possible, right? It is possible for people of, you know, a certain level of authority to look at people below them 
and see them as more equals, but there needs to be familiarity. There needs to be a noted layer of communication and mutual respect. If that is not there, public transcript plays the default card. Okay? Right, so to review, right, hidden transcripts are, among other things, acts of resistance within and at times against hegemonic political and cultural discourse. This is done to maintain solidarity of in-group identity and to dichotomize group identity from the dominant group or class, which is oftentimes reinforced subordination because of the dominant group is still identified as such, right? So in other words, hidden transcripts might be a way of, if not rebelling directly against the dominant classes, differentiating them, right? Holding the dominant classes at bay and allowing the subordinates some element, some modicum, some space of identity, maneuverability, flexibility, um, you know, internal decision making. But more often than not, unless, you know, systemic rebellion and a replacement of the hegemonic order is the primary objective, the hidden transcripts are still going to acknowledge the prominence of the dominant groups, right? Even when um, individuals, let's say like Malcolm X, was promoting this sense of black rage um, against outgroup society. I mean, what was he really doing? Was he calling for an armed uprising? No. Was he calling for um, a secession from the United States? No. What he was effectively doing was saying that black identity um, up to that point was too passive and oftentimes too deferential to the white narrative. And even though, right, individuals like Martin Luther King and others were calling for more nonviolent resistance, right, Malcolm X was someone who was frustrated with the idea that the only livelihoods that blacks could maybe carve out in the United States at that time were you know, within, let's say, the entertainment industry, uh, within some kind of showcase industry, which still place them in some kind of servile role um, against the white lawmakers, police officers, judges, politicians, among others. So even in this sense, right, Malcolm X is promoting, let's say, group self-love, group self-respectability, even the idea of just simply divorcing themselves from the white narrative doesn't mean overthrowing it, doesn't mean replacing it, just simply means stop identifying as a black within the prefabricated structure of white America and conforming to what you think they want you to be. Now, even in this more confrontational approach, there is still the understanding that black identity is going to, at the absolute, absolute best, at some point just run parallel, detached but parallel from that of white America. It is still acknowledging that white American political identity, and you gotta remember, this is the 50s and the 60s here, okay? White American political identity is still going to be the paramount predominant group. So even here, right, narratives of hidden transcripts are various acts of resistance what one chooses to do and how far one chooses to go, right, is oftentimes predicated on the fear of repercussion, right? So Martin Luther King uh, may have realized what he may have wanted to have done, but know full well the veracity of white American responses, knowing that both him and Malcolm X, and it just came out, as I think I just read earlier today, Malcolm X's family had just released a few documents, some papers saying that the FBI and the NYPD were, uh, like King, absolutely determined to ruin this man, um, if not outwardly assassinate him. Um, knowing the repercussions that you were going to take at that time as an outspoken black individual talking about the not only the racial inequalities in the United States, but the systemic and the institutional inequalities that largely, um, you know, condone 
the racial inequalities, um, is going to get one targeted. I mean, there's no question about it, right? The, the FBI, the, you, know, all, you know, all of these groups here are going to be looking at people like Malcolm X, Martin Luther King as internal contagion. Um, and so in that sense, hidden transcripts oftentimes limit themselves by how far they can go and what they are willing to accept um, in retaliation. So if you are a lone actor and you don't care about the fate of your life and you feel that you need to make a statement and you will die for it, okay, then you are a martyr. If you are a group, if you're a minority group, a racial minority group, a religious minority group, and you feel that you need to voice your legitimate grievances against the prevailing racism within the larger country, are you willing to accept the possible consequences that come along with that, right? And you know, look, this is not just even in the United States, right? We have cases around the world where minority groups, religious groups, ethnic groups, linguistic groups, um, people are wondering, why aren't you being more open and vocal? Why aren't you really protesting and fighting for your rights? Um, and the in-group will respond to this conceptual conversation by effectively saying, <laughs> you have the safety of saying this from, a, from an IP address outside of this country. You can say this from the safety of the United States or the United Kingdom or Germany or Australia. Um, I live here, wherever that happens to be. Um, I can't say that as much as I would like to because I know that unless, you know, the United Nations, um, you know, the European Union, some major international force is going to step in and help me and back me up, I realize that by saying that, I just am just disrupting a hornet's nest, right? So it's, you know, keep quiet, hope for better days, Maybe, 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 right? Control the discourse through other elements, art, entertainment, literature, where eventually the predominant thought begins to change, begins to moderate with a new generation, right? So, you know, for instance, um, I could say with a fair degree of confidence that 30 years ago, right, 1990, 1991, it was still very um, taboo to openly acknowledge yourself as homosexual in this country. Um, I mean, you weren't going to be openly condemned and lynched for it, at least not in some parts of the country. Um, but it was something that politicians and even the entertainment industry um, would be very hesitant to get behind. Um, you know, say what you want now about Ellen DeGeneres, but she was one of the first of this newer generation to effectively say, you know, I'm gay, right? There it is, I'm gay. Um, and she was willing to accept the repercussions of her career. Um, you know, before she became a daytime talk show host, she was a comedian, she was an actress, and, you know, Hollywood just kind of dropped her. Um, and she did pick up the Ellen DeGeneres show and has been kind of doing that, you know, ever since. Now, today, 2020, 2021, I mean, you know, you come out and you say, I'm gay, or you come out and say, hey, I'm a different gender, or, you know, I'm whatever it is I am, right? Um, there is far more tolerance, or there is far more acceptance of that, right? It's, it's not where some people would want it to be, but it is definitely an improvement from 20, 30 years ago. The same thing with, let's say, somebody who said in the 80s or the 90s that they smoke marijuana. Well, you know, you're your stereotypical bum, you know, you do nothing but watch Tom and Jerry cartoons and just get high all day, whatever it is, right? Now people say, I smoke marijuana. They might even see you as an entrepreneur. They might see you as like, well, you know, you smoke marijuana. I drink uh, craft beer, you know, together we make a fantastic team or whatever it is, right? So the idea here is that hidden transcripts can, in fact help to change the predominant discourse, but it's gradual. And oftentimes, it is done more so through what I will you know, quickly refer to as soft diplomacy, art, entertainment, literature, and eventually just kind of becomes 
more accepted, if nothing else, by a younger generation of individuals who have kind of grown up with that and see it as less problematic, right, than, let's say, their parents or grandparents did. This is sort of what is known as the weapons of the weak. And I use this term because this was an earlier book that Scott had written back in 1985, the so-called The Weapons of the Weak. What do the disenfranchised, the demobilized, um, the non-privileged do? What do they have um, at their disposal to not just assert themselves and their values and their identities, um, but how do they eventually change the larger discourse if they're able to change it at all. Um, and here, you know, we begin to see the utility in more nonviolent resistance movements, right? Um, protest, but not actively violent protest, right? Sit-ins, strikes, boycotts, um, acts of self-promotion. You know, again, we can go back to the example from last week with Martin Luther King. And note that even though his legacy has become extremely commodified at this point, what still remains in the narrative, you know, especially the state-sponsored narrative, is his boycott leadings, right? The Montgomery bus boycott, the, you know, the march in Selma. These were seen as acts of defiance back in the day, right? King got, you know, the fire hose. He got the beatings. He got the cops and the dogs, you know, sicked on him and his followers. But today, we look at that retroactively and say, that is what openly exposed the ugliness of racism in the United States. So he, you know, you take one for the team, you take the beating, you take the condemnation, you take the spitting, you take the, um, you know, the photos of the angry white people yelling and screaming and hurling insults at that one black girl going to school, you know, the integrated schools now, remember? You know, you, you take those photos and you're like, all right, this is an ugly, ugly moment, but it changes perceptions at some point, right? It makes people embarrassed to think, oh my God, I cannot believe that 60 years ago, people were actually fucking doing this, right? So it will risk repercussions from the dominant group, no question about it. But it identifies the source of violence and injustice. And now you just kind of, in so many words, play the waiting game. Let that incubate within public consciousness, not just in the present period, but for future generations as well. So the weapons of the weak in this sense are in many cases, the display of their weakness, the display of their plight, but not through woe is me, but also through the promotion and identification through art, music, food, and fashion. So here, both Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were on the same page, right? Both of them called for the self-promotion and the self-respect of the black community. Both of them said, we will no longer identify as quiet, meek, subordinate individuals, but instead we will look to our contributions, our writers, our thinkers, our musicians, our artists, right? Our scientists. We are all contributors to this country. We are not weak and docile, demobilized peasants but we have things that we can be proud of. We have things in history. We have the Harlem Renaissance. We have Motown. We have Chicago. We have Detroit. We have all of these things to show that we are not only an active and mobile cohesive unit, but we are a fundamental component of what it means to be American in the 20th century. And by doing so, this promotes a brand for the group. Right? Now, this is something that's a little outside of the readings for this week, but the promotion of a brand, a positive brand, right, through music, entertainment, comedy, other elements like that, right? Yes, it still kind of plays on the narrative of the minstrel, and some people might still see that as a form of subordination, but even if that were the case, right? And let's just run with that. Even if that were the case, it shows then that they still are 
a lot more popular and um, attractive than some of our politicians who are in power, right? If the idea is in order to achieve power, we have to become part of the ruling class. Well, the ruling class are usually people who we don't really like. They're boring. They're dumb. They're out of touch, right? Who are you going to find more in common with, right? The white waspy lawmaker or Chris Rock? Who has a better grasp on the philosophical, sociological, cultural landscape of the country today? Jerry Falwell or Chris Rock? Exactly. So in that sense, the brand is something that incubates within society to at some point when the dominant class still tries to assert their authority over the subordinates, more and more people, white, black, and others, will look at the dominant class and say, what the hell is your problem? Like, wh what are you doing, right? So it might not necessarily alleviate the plight of the subordinate group, but it acts as a form of soft diplomacy, right? Soft diplomacy is something that is you know, more a vocation within international relations and comparative politics, but I really liked it because it's, it's culture. It's cultural branding, something that is very familiar to not only comparative politics, but psychology, sociology, anthropology, um, branding through the form of art, music, food, fashion, among other things. Right? And this isn't necessarily just for the, the black community, right? It could be for anybody. Could be for any subordinate group, the Latino community, the Italian community at one point, which was discriminated against, the Irish community, which was heavily discriminated against, right? These groups sort of rebrand themselves to be seen as part of the larger mosaic of American culture. Because trust me, if American culture were nothing but Midwestern waspiness, we would be a very, very boring country <laughs> indeed. Okay? So this leads me to, you know, gravitate towards really the last part of this discussion and note the hidden transcript of the casita. Right? This is something that is um, largely specific to New York, um, even more so the South Bronx, but it is a way in which Hidden transcripts not only help keep the identity and the values and traditions of a specific group of immigrants alive, but how these hidden transcripts actually transform large areas of the South Bronx, which were, for the most part, written off as Mad Max No Man's Land, into workable, intact neighborhoods, right? at least for a short period of time. So the story behind this is, as early as the 1960s, the, there were large areas of Manhattan that were just undergoing you know, economic downturn, right? Manufacturing industries were you know, being moved out, many to New Jersey, uh, to the Carolinas, to every place else like that, right? New York had kind of reached its working class manufacturing peak by the late 40s. And then with the Interstate Highway Act, the act, you know, the, the, the growth of suburbia, um, you know, white migration, the idea is that, you know, your parents came here on the boat, lived in a tenement house. Now your job is to move out to New Jersey or Long Island to get a suburb in the household, right, or whatever. You know, New York is sort of witnessing um, a number of institutional and economic downturns. Add to this um, the, among other things, the construction of the Cross Bronx Expressway, which was basically this scar, this, this ditch that was just, you know, plowed, drilled right through the heart of multiple neighborhoods, um, creates an area in which what were once livable areas to now be barren and abandoned, right? People are moving out. No one wants to live next to the highway. Uh, you know, small shops and industries are closing up. And, you know, New York itself, in New York City, doesn't really invest in the Bronx. Um, and to that measure, you know, we can also include large areas of Brooklyn and uh, even um, Upper Manhattan as well. Uh, when the Brooklyn Navy Yards closed down in the 60s around the same time, you know, the area around LIU kind of falls into disrepair. You know, jobs are lost. Um, there's no investment. You know, so you kind of get the idea here that New York was, by the 1970s, kind of a, a dangerous place to live. Um, it was affordable as anything, but, you know, you went to New York, in some cases, you took your life into your own hands. You rode the subway. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, good luck. 
one of the areas that was affected the most was the South Bronx. Um, and we're talking about an area that if you were to Google pictures of the Bronx in the 19, late 60s, 1970s, it would look like um, the place was, you know, bombed by the U.S. military. Like it looked like Baghdad or Syria or something like that, right? It looked like some post-apocalyptic no man's land with just block after block of burned out um, apartment building husks. No trees, no nothing, you know, burned out, abandoned cars. I mean, it, it really looked like a nuclear bomb kind of went off here. Um, and the thing is, is that people still lived in the areas, but the area became unruly. Crime was just running rampant. The city was running out of money. And at some point, the NYPD just kind of rode off the Bronx. They're just like, we're, we're, not, going, we're not even going in there. Um, and, and in many situations, the reason why the NYPD did this, it wasn't because of um, you know, any kind of racism, although I'm sure that you know, some parts of it were, but largely because the NYPD just felt we're not being funded. We don't have the support. I'm not sending, my, I'm not sending cops into the area knowing they're not going to come out. So the whole area was just kind of turned into this, you know, as I said, Mad Max no man's land. Um, and within this scenario, right, within this scenario rose a number of neat little initiatives, little creative ideas among the Latino and Caribbean population, specifically um, the Puerto Rican communities, to turn a number of abandoned lots um, and sometimes entire city blocks were these abandoned lots, um, into community gardens and meeting places, right? The understanding was, we live here, um, and if we are not going to get any specific funding or support from the city or the state of New York, can we at least be given the green light to just kind of take over these abandoned areas that no one is using and turn them into little gardens, little places to, you know, do some farming. I mean, like, literally, we're going back to agriculture, <laughs> you know? We're going back to literally agriculture. Um, and in a way, um, the city was, you know, happy to do so, right? Because it didn't cost them anything. Um, you know, take these areas, their little community gardens, whatever it is. But they were built to conform to Puerto Rican and Caribbean aesthetics, so more than just simply gardens where trees and plants are being um, cultivated, they would put these little houses, right? And casita literally means little house. Um, you know, maybe like a one to two room house with the noted features of a pitched roof, a veranda, and a surrounding garden area for flowers, vegetables, or animals, right? And the idea of the casita was not so much for people to live in as squatters, but to serve as community centers, you know, little shelters from the rain, from the sun, um, but also the idea that, you know, you're not going to just go to an open area that's just got flowers and chickens and whatever it is that's there, but you need like a little house. You want to create the aesthetic image of what life is, you know, back in Puerto Rico and other Caribbean islands. And what this ultimately was is a reclamation of land for local ethnic and immigrant purposes. And it became a visually public hidden transcript, right? Because it serves the local Hispanic community. As I said, it's meeting places for people to just, you know, meet and talk and, you know, play some cards, you know, have a drink, play some dominoes makeshift town halls where community leaders would organize to talk about, you know, different areas, problems, issues with the community. Community commons also. People would see this as their shared land. So it wasn't that one person just kind of took over the land and, you know, controlled all of the vegetables or the animal. No, everybody kind of came together to cooperate. This was their area, their investment, and without any outside interference, the place turned, these places turned into viable magnets for the community. And what's even more so is that as these empty lots were being reclaimed more and more by the public, they served as safe havens from urban crime and vice. So it was a little oasis for people, children, 
to go to and play under the supervision, observation of adults, usually, you know, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, and it became sort of a recreated village. And as a result, right, drug dealers, crime, vice, were chased out of the area. People were monitoring the streets. People were making certain who came into and out of these little communities which were surrounded by fences, so it's not like anybody can just kind of walk on in. Um, and it was effectively turned into, right, a viable living community that reversed the trends of urban blight, right? Reversed the trends of urban blight. And it's a, sort of a blending, as I've said, of both the public and the hidden. So the origin of the casita, the origin of the community gardens, were, you know, created and, man and, and, and approved by the city of New York. These lots were rented out to local communities via this uh, Green Thumb program, right? This is under Mayor Koch, 1978, as community gardens. Um, and they were, you know, rented out to the community for, I think, like a dollar a year or whatever it was. It was like nothing, right? Because it, it kind of shows you how much that the city of New York was just willing to just kind of, you know, give up as much of the South Bronx as possible. If the people want to do something with it, go right ahead. Um, but the idea was that these areas would be community gardens. That's it. The casita was something that was technically illegal, all right, because part of the um, stipulation was that you can't build anything on there uh, with the understanding that if you build something there, someone could move in and, you know, squat or use it as a home. You know, God forbid people should find, you know, intricate and innovative ways of living. Um, and while the casita was never something for one person, right, think of it as like a gazebo, right? Think of it as like a pavilion or something like that, right? Um, it did violate city codes. Um, and as much as the city tried to dissuade, uh, the local community was like, no, 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 this is, this, this is how we're going to do it, okay? Casita, house, flowers, vegetables, goats, chickens, whatever it is, it, it all comes, this comes part of the package here, okay? It comes part of the package deal. Um, and they were built within the garden largely for aesthetics, shelter, and cultural symbolism. So we're talking about people who previously could only afford to live in these big, sterile public housing authorities. Um, and I'm sure you've seen them, you know, all throughout New York. But many of them come from, you know, areas in which living was far more rural and pastoral. So as far as they were concerned, if the city gives them a plot of land to effectively do what they want... They're going to build these little things simply as keystones for the larger community gardens. And this became sort of a publicly seen hidden transcript. The hidden transcript of not necessarily defiance against New York, but a hidden transcript of what in-group members do when they are speaking and interacting and cooperating and communicating with one another. And attempts by city planners to remove these casitas sort of increase the determination of the communities to erect and defend them even more so because now it's no longer an aesthetic thing, it's a cultural thing. It's an identity thing, it's an ethnic, it's a political thing, right? Especially if it's their neighborhoods and their communities. So if, you know, City Hall, way down at the southern tip of Manhattan, is saying you can do this, but you can't do that to communities up in Mott Haven. Um, you know, at some point, the people are like, you know, you're down there and we're up here. This is our world, and we are making do with our world within the larger structure, within the larger confines of what you have provided for us. And, you know, the casitas were for the most part there up and up throughout the uh, the 1990s. Um, and usually by the end of the 90s, definitely in the 2000s, when land once again became lucrative in New York, and the landlords that had previously owned these larger buildings, which I don't think ever relinquished control of the land, but you know they weren't getting rent or anything off of them, 
started to grandfather clause their own rights to the property by putting in new apartment housing, new luxury condos. You know, the casitas kind of just start disappearing. There are a few. There are a few that still are around, right? And I'm pretty certain, right, if you can see them, you know, now all of a sudden you're going to look at them and go, oh, look at that little house in the middle of these big apartment blocks. I wonder what that's for. That's what, the, that's what it is, right? That's what the casitas are. So, I mean, look, visually, uh, you know, visually getting the point across, this is or was what the South Bronx was from the 70s through the 90s. Um, not a nice place to go. Um, and as I mentioned, it's just like a place just abandoned by everything else here. I mean, this is very, very different uh, from what it is today. But the reclamation of the land, as you can see here, is very much public. But public for an in-group community. So as you can see, right, there's benches, there's open areas, there's little flowers. The idea here is this serves as the community center for a group of people that are living in these larger um, public housing authorities where there is no community center. There's no town center. It's just these big, broad streets and boulevards, one, how, one apartment block after another after another. And the aestheticism of them, right, kind of not only creates a sense of homeliness and familiarity, but it also starts greenifying the land again. So trees are being planted, right? Houses are being painted vibrant colors as opposed to these drab, you know, red, you know, and brown brick apartment complexes. Shrubbery, trees, shade, places for children to play in safety provide a sense of community, village life, rural aesthetics, and in-group cohesion. So this is ultimately the discussion that I would like to continue um, in class on Wednesday, right? The notion of these, um, you know, transcripts, both public as well as hidden. Hidden transcripts are, you know, they, they come in a variety of cases. Some are openly rebellious. Some just look to constantly buck and, you know, resist the larger system. And some just simply find ways of coping and working within a system that they have no intention of replacing or overthrowing, but just finding some meaning, some informal meaning in everyone's daily life. So informal social networks certainly very much at play with the casita um, phenomenon. And so I guess in that sense, that kind of brings us really to the end of you know what, we're, what we've read this week. Um, I now turn it over to you and welcome your comments both here on the video as well as in our discussion forums on Blackboard. And I hope to show a few more cases of uh, dominant versus hidden transcripts in art, music, movies, and other forms of entertainment uh, in our class on Wednesday. So I hope to see you all in a couple of days. I hope you enjoyed this material, and I look forward to your comments very, very soon. Take care, everyone.